everybody. I'm Edward Jonas from, from the University in, uh, of Cape Town. And it's really a pleasure for me to welcome you to this um, weekly Gecko meeting. Today is going to be endoscopy and particularly lower GI. Um, also, I want to thank the uh, Gecko team uh, or the, the Echo team from the University of New Mexico that facilitate this for us, Project Echo. Um, as you know, the sessions are held weekly on a Wednesday. And we've had, uh, when I got the mail from Cheryl, 62 delegates from 15 Sub-Saharan African countries. Um, and just um, the chat will also be open for questions um, during the um, uh, presentations. Uh, if you prefer to, to ask the questions yourself, you can just raise your hand. So it's really a pleasure for me to introduce um, Dr. Dion Levine, that's going to talk first on surveillance uh, in ulcerative colitis. Dr. Levine is a, is a senior gastroenterologist at, uh, in the Division of, of Gastroenterology at Kutuski Hospital in the University of Cape Town. And secondly, also Dr. Jeremy Plaskett, that is going to share some pitfalls on uh, the management of, uh, management of colon cancer with us. And he's um, the head of surgery at Victoria Hospital in Cape Town. So Dion, if you're ready, um, you can start. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, can I share screen? I take it everyone can see the screen and yep. can hear me. Yes, we can. All right. So I'm going to speak about, I just want to get rid of this thing on the side here. Um, anyway, I'm going to speak about endoscopic surveillance in ulcerative colitis specifically. So why do we survey colons in ulcerative colitis? because there's this concept of colitis-associated dysplasia and colitis-associated cancer. And the feeling is that the adenoma carcinoma sequence that you usually see with sporadic adenomas, the dysplasia, low-grade, high-grade carcinoma sequence is not obeyed by people who have ulcerative colitis. And that you get earlier dysplastic change and you get earlier mutations in the genes and sometimes they are reversed. So the KRAS in sporadic carcinoma may be first, whereas the P53 in colitis-associated cancer comes first and earlier. And then there's a whole concern about that these cancers are multifocal neoplasias or cancers, that is cancers arising from a larger field of mucosa. So there seems to be sort of some ge genetic predisposition with the chronic inflammation that you get multiple sites of dysplasia and or cancer, the so-called field cancerization or the field effect, which is very different from the sporadic adenoma. But is this thing a real? Um, this widely cited meta-analysis in 2001 by Eden looked at about 116 studies dating back to 1925. And the cumulative incidence of colorectal cancer as you went through the years from 10, 20, and 30, 10, 20, and 30 years increased to 2, 8, and 18%. Now, this dictated a lot of the protocols in the early 2000s. St. Mark's Hospital is a tertiary hospital in London. And I'm going to speak a lot about the data that come from St. Mark's because there are very, very good endoscopists in Britain in general, colonoscopists, and they have a screening program in colonoscopy in general, and they also have very good surveillance programs. They commenced a surveillance program specifically for ulcerative colitis in 1971. And the data was published in 2015, although they had published about 10 years earlier, and they entered patients with ulcerative colitis defined as proximal to the splenic flexure, annual or biannual colonoscopies, eight to 10 years after the onset of the symptoms. And they ended up with almost 1,400 patients and did over eight, almost 9,000 colonoscopies, which was published about five years ago. It's a remarkable um, study. And their 42 years experience, because it went 
the data went to 2013, showed a much less cumulative incidence of colorectal cancer at 10, 20, 30, and 40. If you remember, the Eden study showed 18% at 40 years. So it wasn't quite as drastic as we thought it was. We know that UC increases the risk of colon cancer in population-based cohorts, roughly 2.4-fold, and that if you have histological inflammation that is ongoing, it does increase your risk for colorectal cancer by a similar amount. And these are two recent publications. So let's accept there is a risk, and we can see that it's related to duration, the extent of the colitis, and if you have persistent uncontrolled inflammation. The next question to ask is, all right, so what is the aim of screening and surveillance of patients with UC? It's to prevent life-threatening colon cancer, which would be the, the, the kind of overall thing you want to prevent. Or to remove the colon just in time to prevent dysplasia from becoming cancer. Or if you find a cancer, to catch it early and stop it from spreading, because we know the earlier that you catch a colon cancer, the better the outcome. But I also think it's to prevent a colectomy in, in patients who don't necessarily need a colectomy and to deal with visible lesions endoscopically. So if we look at how many patients get cancer, and again, I'm going to look at this in Mark series, 5% of their patients during the surveillance program developed colorectal cancer out of the 8,650 colonoscopies. The overall prevalence of colorectal cancer in the Eden study, which was published in, 20, in 2001, bizarrely showed a kind of similar prevalence of colorectal cancer of 5.4% in UC pancolitis specifically, but they did have patients who had left-sided disease as well, and it was about 3.5%. So it's actually remarkable that there are two studies that show this data, that, it, that patients do get cancer, albeit... I don't know how you look at this. Is this a lot or a little? I'm not sure. If you took the patients who had colorectal cancer and had colectomy for colorectal cancer in the St. Mark's cohort, 37 patients who had colectomy for documented colorectal cancer had multisynchronous cancer or neoplasia at a second site. And that goes back to that um, slide up front, which says this is a slightly different kind of cancer than sporadic adenoma. So does surveillance stop cancer? Well, in the 42 years of experience uh, from St. Mark's, there was early detection of colorectal cancer in the 40-year in the cohort, Dukes A and B. There was less interval cancer in the patients enrolled in the surveillance program, as you probably would expect, and that is defined by symptoms requiring intervention before the next schedule scope. But what was interesting is there was no decrease in overall cancers. There was a decrease in overall cancers in the first three decades, and that may be related to multi, multiple things, perhaps technology improving, etc. But it could be that there isn't a decrease in overall cancer in the last decade because patients are having their colons not taken out as we deal with um, things endoscopically, or that picking up low-grade dysplasia doesn't actually translate into decreasing overall cancers. But that's a whole discussion, but it's just interesting data. So when should you start screening the patient? If a patient has had eight to 10 years, of colitis, either symptoms, or if you don't know when the symptoms started, when you make the diagnosis of UC, patients with ulcerative colitis, not proctitis, and by that I mean not distal to the um, RS junction, the rectosigmoid junction. Anything above this would be enrolled in a colonoscopy screening and then surveillance. And patients with PSC, even if they don't have any history of ulcerative colitis or symptoms, at diagnosis. Then obviously there are Crohn's patients um, who've got more than a third of their colon, but we're not talking about Crohn's today. The important thing is to try and do these screening colonoscopies during the remission, the remission phase, because there can be some problems if there's chronic or acute inflammation and calling dysplasia, and the colon needs to be clean. 
So now we've screened the patient, we've done the colonoscopy, let's follow some surveillance guidelines. And what happens next is what I call the human condition, because these are the guidelines as published about five years ago with various societies publishing all sorts of guidelines, more or less the same, but if you wanna hang your hat on one of them, which one are you gonna choose? The BSG, the AGA, ECHO, um, the, the, the uh, NICE Australian, and they've all got updated guidelines now. So I think to try and simplify it, I think we go 10, 5, 3, 1. At 10 years, you start, five years for intervals for low risk, three year intervals for intermediate risk, and one year intervals for high risk. So let's have a quick look at those. What would constitute low risk, which would be five yearly colonoscopies. That would be patients with extensive disease or pancolitis without any inflammation. I think some chronic inflammation perhaps may be acceptable if there's macroscopic normality. Left-sided colitis, which is above the sigmoid and distal to the splenic flexure. And if you've had two previous normal colonoscopies, which obviously you won't see in your screening, it'll have to be two surveillance colonoscopies. Intermediate risk would be three yearly, would be a sense of disease with mild to moderate inflammation. So there's still inflammatory activity. And we know that inflammatory activity is a risk for colorectal cancer. Patient has post-inflammatory polyps or a first degree relative with colon cancer diagnosed over 50. These patients would be in say three yearly. And then if they had a normal colon at three years later, they would then be enrolled in five yearly and so it would go. Then we come to the high risk group, which is yearly. So extensive disease with active inflammation, patients with PSC, including patients who've had a transplant, colorectal cancer in first degree relatives who are young, and patients who've had previous dysplasia, or they've got a stricture detected in the prior five years. Hope that makes sense. Just a word on post-inflammatory polyps. This does reflect more extensive disease and more severe inflammation but there's no evidence that this is an independent predictor of dysplasia in studies, but intuitively it probably would make sense that there would be a higher risk with post-inflammatory polyps. What's no longer in vogue and the problem in medicine is, is yesterday's dogma is today's heresy. When I was uh, doing gastroenterology, if you didn't mention this, you were cut down at the knees um, the dysplasia associated lesion of mass or adenoma-like or non-adenoma-like. We don't use that when we talk about um, adenomas or lesions in ulcerative colitis any longer. So we're going to look for dysplasia. The premise of these surveillance programs is that we want to reduce right life-threatening ca cancer. And to do this, we need a clean colon. We need good colonoscopy technique. And I include sequel intubation rate, slow withdrawal rate, et cetera. And we want to use the best technology available. There's no doubt that as you went from fiber optic to standard light to high definition white light, things improved all around. This is not unique to surveillance in UC. This is, unique, uh, this is for general endoscopy. So what have we got on offer in our toolbox? So we've got a white light endoscopy with or without high definition. Now, what I mean by that is all the current stacks are high definition. It just depends on your monitor, whether that is standard or high definition. But in general, in 2021, we're looking at white light endoscopy with high definition stacks and monitors. And the suggestion is that patients in surveillance program should have four quadrant undirected biopsy every 10 centimeters and directed biopsies at the endoscopist's discretion if they see something they don't like the look of. So you'll end up by 32 biopsies plus whatever you've targeted because uh, colon is about eight, 80 centimeters and every 10 centimeters, you'll be doing four. Then we've got chroma endoscopy, which is, means putting a spray on that will try to get topographical representation and help you recognize things that white light high definition endoscopy wouldn't. So we've got methylene blue and indigo carmine. And my understanding is these are absorbed by the intestinal epithelium and it colors blue and things that don't look blue are things that you can have a look at and recognize and try and biopsy them. So it offers you a chance of directed biopsy, so targeted. It offers you a chance of recognizing things that you may be able to do endoscopic therapy on. It may turn out to be less onerous because you're not taking 32 biopsies and less costly, 
and it may also influence surveillance intervals. And this is the suggested method in surveillance guidelines. Does it work? Well, there is an increased yield in dysplastic lesions, and by far the low-grade dysplasias are picked up more than high-grade in general. And there is some evidence that macroscopic lesions, so flat adenomas, for example, are picked up. And the St. Mark's um, data, when they did introduce chrome endoscopy and they did adjust for when they were only using white light with high definition, there seems to be a twofold pickup in dysplasia versus white light endoscopy. So it's not remarkable, but there seems to be indication that it is better. This was a recent publication of eight parallel group randomized controlled trials, as you can see from 2003 to 2017, where they compared dye spray versus standard light, narrowband imaging versus high definition, dye spray, et cetera. Not a bad number of patients. And I liked how they summarized this because I'm not very good with stats. So assume in clinical practice, that a high definition white light dysplasia detection rate of 10%, narrowband imaging would detect dysplasia in 13%, and dye spray or um, um, chrome endoscopy would detect dysplasia in about 18%. So there is some increase in detecting dysplastic lesions. And I included this article by Alexanderson because he is from uh, the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, and that is where our good Professor Jonas spent a large portion of his career before he found fame and fortune in, in South Africa. And they did show, this is a randomized controlled trial of 305 patients, and they showed that, again that dysplastic lesions are more commonly found in high definition chroma endoscopy, but not by a huge amount. Nevertheless, the guidelines, the echo statement from 2017 that says surveillance colonoscopy should take into account locally precise and chrome endoscopy with target biopsies has been shown to increase displays of detection rate. However, if you don't have this, you resort to the random biopsies and targeted biopsies with high definition endoscopy if you have it. And the scenic consensus statement said when performing surveillance, high definition colochroma is suggested rather than white light but there's low quality evidence and the evidence is being accumulated. I'll leave it to you to read these guidelines and decide which way you wanna go. How do you do this? Well, for pan chroma endoscopy, there's methylene blue and that's what I've got experience with. You mix one amp in 240 to 250 mils of water. And then if you want to do more targeted, they say you should make it more concentrated. I don't do this, but it, you know that's what is said. This is a methylene blue that I use. I think it's an amp, I'm not sure, but I put it into a bowl and then I add 250 mils of water and I use a spray catheter and I make a complete mess and sometimes it's too dark and sometimes it's too light. And the principle is that you go do your colonoscopy, get to the cecum, put out the spray catheter, spray, withdraw 10, 20 centimeters, go back in, suction any pools, have a look around, come back out. And so you're going in and out while you're doing the colonoscopy. So you're doing it basically three times, getting there, coming back, getting there, coming back. And what you're trying to do is pick up, say something that looks like this on white light, and that maybe gives you a better outline of something more concerning, or you see something here with, the white, with, with white light, and you see something a little bit more concerning that you can target with biopsies or even remove endoscopically if you can. And this is another example of a little adenoma. This is different from narrowband imaging. They're not the same. Narrowband imaging is virtual. It so you press that button on the stack and it exploits the different properties of light. It filters out the blue-green spectrum and this wavelength is selectively absorbed by the vessels so that the, the, so that the capillaries look brown or blue or green. So here we go. This is narrowband imaging as opposed to dye spray chroma endoscopy. You can still put the narrowband on there, but it's not the same. And the experts say that it's not advocated for UC cancer surveillance. But obviously, if you're going to see something on the UC surveillance and you don't have chromo, you'll put the MBI or eye scan if you've got... Uh, or FICE if you've got either Pentax or Fujinon equipment. 
what do you do if you find something? And this is a patient we had with ulcerative colitis, no, no inflammation, with PSC and a lesion at the hepatic flexure. This is just methylene blue injected to try and see where the outline is. This is not chroma endoscopy. This is narrowband imaging and it extended around the corner there. And this is another patient. We injected some methylene blue in the cecum of a patient with PSC. It looks like there's some surrounding inflammation. I'll get back to that. We try and characterize the polyp. You've got the polyp, the Paris classification, which is what we use for general polyps. And then there's a slightly different classification used for, for um, polyps um, when you do UC surveillance. Either it's a visible dysplasia or polypoid, which means that it's protruding from the mucosa, they say 2.5 millimeters or non-polypoidal. So these are visible where, there's, where it's flat or there's very little protrusion or it's invisible. And obviously you have to have done a colonoscopy and biopsies to find invisible dysplasia. So how do we manage these lesions? Well, if it's a visible lesion, it's either polypoid or non-polypoid, or it's an invisible lesion where you've biopsied and you picked up something you didn't expect. The question you have to ask if it's a visible lesion, either polypoid or non-polypoid, which is what you would ask normally when you were doing any colonoscopy, can I resect this endoscopically? Can I see the margins clearly, i.e. is it demarcated? Or is there lateral spread and not well demarcated? So I'm not sure. Is there submucosal invasion? Is it depressed in the middle? I don't mean depressed as in sad. Or is there no lifting on injection, which would then imply that things are a little bit deeper than you first uh, expect? And are there any multifocal lesions? So are there lesions elsewhere in the colon that you see in a patient who's undergoing UC surveillance that you think may also be dysplastic lesions? If you can see the margins clearly, there is no submucosal uh, invasion and no multifocal lesions, then you can do an endoscopic resection or give it a go. As long as you've got removal on visual inspection, there is removal on histological specimen, and there's no adjacent or dis distant tissue that has dysplasia. Because if you can't do this, you're gonna to have to consider colectomy. If it's invisible displays, that poses a problem because you've done your screening or you've done a surveillance after that and suddenly you've got some dysplastic displays here on those 32 biopsies, you're gonna, the suggestion is, well, if you can't see anything, you repeat the colo with chromo and see if you can in fact see a lesion, either polypoid or non-polypoid that you can deal with endoscopically. So if there's a visible lesion, you can give it a go. If there's no visible lesion, you take random samples again. And now it depends on the degree of dysplasia. Is it multifocal, low grade or high grade? In which case you may need to consider a colectomy. And that is the suggestion because you can't control the low grade and high grade inflammation by removing it. If it's unifocal, so one of the specimens shows low grade dysplasia, well, then you've got a bit of a problem. You need to have an MDT. And certainly you need to review the histology by a second pathologist because sometimes LGD is called by one pathologist and not by the other. And then you get into the debate of whether you should have a colectomy or not. I mean, colectomy is a morbid um, procedure. So I just looked at the colectomies of patients in the St. Mark's study and another study as well. The rate of colorectal cancer in the specimens for high-grade dysplasia was 50%. So these patients did not have cancer on their biopsies, but they had cancer in the specimens. And for low-grade dysplasia, the rate of colorectal cancer in the specimen was 25% in this study by Marx. And then I looked at another study which showed about 30%. But it still means that 70% of patients who have a colectomy for LGD don't have a colorectal cancer in the specimen. So I'm just pointing out this is not a, this is a tricky area. It's not simple. Now, if you don't have a colectomy, I looked at the St. Mark's data. So they, were, they found dysplasia, that's high grade, indefinite, and low grade, in 6.5% of the 850 patients in the active surveillance program still. Remember, they had 1,370 patients. But by far, mostly these were LGDs. I then calculated that the entire 40-year cohort, it was about 18%. And in another study I looked at, it was about... 10%. So it seems to be that you're going to find dysplasia in that number of patients in these studies. 
But the problem is dysplasia may never progress, and in fact, it may regress. And there is contradictory data on progression of low-grade dysplastic lesion. I'm not talking about multifocal or patients with non-polyphoid lesion. I'm talking about invisible dysplasia. And this may reflect a pathology overcall. So you're making an overdiagnosis, and now you're getting patients into surveillance programs and thinking, well, maybe we should take their colons out. And I looked at the colectomies done in the St. Mark study for patients who had low-grade dysplasia, and in 25%, there wasn't any low-grade dysplasia. So just an interesting point. So detection may not translate into life save, and that's always the problem with improving technology, improving surveillance programs. Is what we find going to translate into benefit for the patient? And that also fits into the artificial intelligence that's now coming along to detect small polyps in, in obviously not UC surveillance programs. This is quite interesting. If you looked at patients who didn't have a colectomy and you took the probability of remaining cancer-free versus the time since neoplasia diagnosis of index, these are no neoplasia or sporadic adenoma. This is low grade, five years, 10 years, the cumulative incidence of colorectal cancer in the St. Mark study was 20 to 30% and at HGG was 54%. I suppose HCG is acceptable because it is concerning to have high-grade dysplasia. Interesting. But in another study of, 100, of 14 studies with 670 patients, they found that looking at low-grade dysplasia <clears throat> was a 0.8% annual incidence of colorectal cancer versus non-dysplastic UC was 0.3. So just an interesting take of if you didn't have a colectomy, would it make any difference? So to end, I think the most important interventions, irrespective of what you have available, whether you're going to do chroma endoscopy, whether you're going to stand on your head and look at it upside down, is you need a clean colon and you need good colonoscopy technique because that surpasses any tricks that we may have in the technology. I think you sh should follow surveillance guidelines because we, well, certainly we do because we don't have any of our own data. So if we don't have our own data, we've got to look elsewhere for data and guidelines, but you have to be pragmatic and try not to cause harm. I'm not saying don't follow the guidelines, but just have some perspective. And I think diaspheric coma endoscopy should probably be used in high-risk patients. Those patients who with the progression to more advanced neoplasia has been shown in reasonable data. So the patient with long-standing disease with poor control, the patient with prior dysplasia, either invisible dysplasia or they've had multifocal dysplasia on a colonoscopy and you didn't want to do a colectomy and the patient didn't want a colectomy. Certainly patients with PSC, although I might add that very few of these surveillance studies have more than a handful of PSC patients. I mean, fair enough. And the family of history of a young, of young colorectal cancer. Um, remember, just to say that you can get sporadic adenomas in UC where it's not related to the colitis. And in this study um, at St. Mark's, I looked at how many, about 6% had sporadic adenomas, and there's no increased risk in a, in a sporadic adenoma in colorectal cancer in UC patients, provided it's not in an area of inflammation. So the, so the issue is that if you do see what you think is a sporadic adenoma, biopsy around the lesion to make sure it's not in an area of inflammation. Because if it is, it changes the dynamic completely. So just to end off getting back to this patient, I don't remember all the details, but we fiddled around here. We weren't sure. And we ended up having a colectomy because he was a PSC patient. And in fact, he had post-operative complications. It wasn't a cancer. I think it was low-grade dysplasia. He survived. But you know whether we did good with him, I'm not sure. And I think I'm going to end there. Thank you very much. And oh, just some, in, these are the, some interesting st um, statements and stuff if you want to read. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dion, for this, um, for this comprehensive overview. Um, there were a couple of questions. Um, Wisdom had two questions, and um, I'm going to ask him to ask the questions himself. But I just have uh, another question here from um, um, Dr. Uh, Igembe that asked a question that I also wondered about. So if you take these random biopsies uh, yeah. every centimeters, do you put them in the same specimen bottle or do you uh, use uh, 32 different bottles or how do you do? There's no, there's no guidelines to say what you do because the principle is that if you're finding 
invisible dysplasia where you're doing 32 biopsies that it's a field effect and so you know i i actually divide all my biopsies up into ascending colon or right side and then i will do random for the transverse left side and rectum unless i specifically want to look at various segments because you can see different normal histology on the right side that can look chronic uh, versus the rest of the colon. But the principle here is that you're not going to do segmental colectomy. You're trying to survey patients in a surveillance program and find if they've got invisible dysplasia, which has been shown to be a field effect. And so I suppose, but I would divide it into ascending and the rest, unless you find something specific elsewhere, then you should put it in its own pot. Thanks. Um, Wisdom, you want to un unmute and just ask uh, Dion your questions? Uh, thank you, Prof. Can you hear me? I can yes. hear you, Wisdom. Yeah. Thanks, Dion. Uh, nice presentation. My thank question you. was on, on uh, the St. Mark's data and the eight-year duration, 10-year duration. I presume that's on the assumption that these patients are daring to therapy and uh, aiming for mucosal healing. In our resource poor settings, some of our patients won't be adhering. And do you think the eight year, 10 year gap to start surveillance is feasible because of um, inadequate healing uh, due to adherence? My second question was- so Let me just deal with that first. So are you asking okay. whether you should, what are you asking me? Should you survey at all or should you survey later? Should we, or... wait, for, should we wait for eight years? Uh, you mean earlier? Yes. Um, well, the, I mean, that's a difficult question. Probably not. But then you have to weigh up the risk of colonoscopy versus the risk of what you're aiming to achieve in terms of a surveillance program and prevention of cancer. So it's very difficult um, to answer that. But I think if you're not getting control of patients, you're going to have to biopsy them because we know that persistent chronic inflammation or active chronic inflammation does increase exactly. your risk of colorectal cancer. Exactly. Yeah. But then yeah. you are going to add colonoscopies to the service. You're going to add risk of problems with colonoscopies. So it does come at a price. What they're saying oh. is that basically let's give it time to declare itself or time for the patient to at least get into remission. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, my next? second question, yeah, my other question was on this uh, 10, cen 10 centimeter segment. Yes. Uh, I thought most guidelines uh, had opted for only saying when you do the 10 centimeter surveillance uh, segment, you biopsy the specific thing you would have seen at 10 centimeter, not to say you need 32 biopsies because cost of 32 histological samples, uh, is it feasible? Well, I don't oh, I, do I, that. I, I, no, didn't I, mean, understand I agree. I, I don't do that because it's just onerous and it's costly, but that's what the guidelines say. So in the absence of a completely clean colon, recognition of an endoscopic lesion that you can target, you're going to have to do these because you're wanting to find invisible dysplasia. Exactly. I mean, that's what the experts say. I've tried to show you that it's not all about just finding invisible dysplasia, that in fact, that may not necessarily be the answer, but we have to follow what the experts in the world say to a certain extent. But I agree with you. It's very costly. It's very cumbersome. And that's why they tried to introduce dye spray chroma endoscopy so that you could get more targeted um, biopsies rather than doing these 32 biopsies. I mean, how they come up with 32, I haven't read the data about that. But you do what, what you can do and hope that you do the best for the patient. I don't do 32. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dion, then there's just one more um, question from Dr. Mbele. Um, yes. In patients that are low and intermediate risk, would one use, uh, should one use the index colonoscopy or subsequent, the last colonoscopy to risk stratify and thereafter guide the, the surveillance intervals? So the five yearly ones, were if you had two previous normal macroscopic um, colonoscopies and you were allowed you allowed a little bit of chronic inflammation 
So let's say you were in a screening program at three years because you had extensive disease with mild to moderate inflammation at active. Um, you would be in a three yearly cycle. You would then say, right, you do the colonoscopy. Macroscopically, it's normal. There maybe is quiescent or maybe a little bit of mild chronicity. We would put the patient probably into five years, I would think, because otherwise we're just doing too many colonoscopies. But I would encourage you to read the guidelines and decide how you want to do it. Remember, you have to do a screening colonoscopy first, where you're going to be doing the biopsies and seeing if there are any problems. And then you will enroll it, roll them in surveillance. If the first colonoscopy is completely normal, quiescent disease, I would tell them to come back in probably in five years. But you know, you'd have you could argue that the guidelines say three years until they've had two normal colonoscopies, which will be the first one and the second one, and then every five years. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Yeah. In the interest of, thank you very much, Dion. No, thanks. I'm thank sure I've spoken you. enough now. Thank you. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we, we can go on to the second uh, talk. So Jeremy, please, if you can share screen and unmute. Thanks, Ed. Hi, everyone. The, my talk is going to be in a little bit of a different theme in the form of a case presentation, just to highlight some of the issues we might find ourselves in with difficult decision making when it comes to managing a patient with colon cancer. And just before we start, as a disclaimer, this is by no means an exercise in criticizing the management of this case, but to rather use the case as an opportunity to learn from the potential common pitfalls we might encounter. So our patient is a 62-year-old male who presented to our surgical unit via our outpatient department with a history of lower abdominal pain, loss of weight, and constipation for about six weeks. New onset constipation with a change in bowel habit. He was hypertensive and a smoker, and because he presented to us during one of the COVID spikes, where we were limiting access to non-urgent colonoscopy services, we elected to first do a CT abdomen in this patient, which went on to show a non-obstructing lesion in his descending colon, as well as a non-enhancing lesion in his liver. Thought unlikely to be a met at that time by the reviewing radiologist. This is a single shot of the axial slices of his abdominal CT scan, where you will be able to see the tumor on the left hand side, with a bit of mesenteric stranding around it around it and it's abutting the anterolateral abdominal wall quite closely. And here is a hyperdense well circumscribed circumscribed liver lesion in segment 3a. These are just the coronal views showing the liver lesion and the left-sided tumor. So we subsequently booked the patient for a colonoscopy where a four millimeter polyp was found in his distal transverse colon. It was cold snared by one of our most experienced endoscopists who, who had the impression that it had been completely excised as well as finding an ulcerating lesion in his descending or sigmoid colon on the left-hand side, of which multiple biopsies were taken. And the clinician felt that it most likely it was a non-benign lesion. That's a picture of the endoscopic image showing the polyp in the transverse colon. That's a different view of the same polyp. And that's a picture of the ulcerating lesion in the descending sigmoid colon. We then went on to refer the patient to an MDT for further review before embarking on any surgical management strategy. And I think due to the cystic nature of the liver lesion 
and the the nature of the report that the where the radiologist felt that this was most likely a cyst rather than a potential metastatic lesion the patient was not actually put through a formal mdt but rather booked for an operation those are this is the the histopathology result of the both the polyp and the tumor biopsies that were sent and both showed colonic adenocarcinoma with lymphovascular invasion. No comment was made in the histopathology report of the completeness of the excision or the, the deep or lateral margin, most likely because it was such a small specimen. Um, Following this, a repeat colonoscopy was performed, I think with the objective of, of reviewing this polypectomy site, which everyone was a bit concerned about at this stage. And at that colonoscopy, no visible residual polyp or any lesion or scar was seen. And it was thought that this lesion was therefore completely excised. And at the same time, the the tumor in the descending or sigmoid colon was tattooed with a view to do a laparoscopic resection of the, the lesion later on at the time of surgery. So we got to a surgery date. The patient was prepped and started as a laparoscopic sigmoidectomy, however, converted to open quite early on due to technical difficulties. A T4 sigmoid tumor was resected and which was found to be quite tethered to the anterior abdominal wall, which was resected on block with the, the tumor itself. The liver lesion, which we were expecting to find was palpable deep to the capsule and did correspond to the CT. And in addition to this, a second capsular liver lesion was found intraoperatively and an excision biopsy of this lesion was performed. No other peritoneal deposits were found intraoperatively at that stage. The histopathology result which came back after the operation unfortunately confirmed a T4N2M1 diagnosis due to the liver lesion showing metastatic adenocarcinoma. So onto the discussion of, of what we maybe could have done differently with this case. Firstly, regarding the tattooing at the initial colonoscopy, what should we have tattooed? Should we have tattooed the, the area where the polyp was snared? Should we have tattooed just the tumor or should we have tattooed both? And what about the polypectomy itself? So firstly, why do we tattoo lesions? And the purpose of this is to mark the lesion for subsequent surgical or endoscopic resection or just endoscopic follow-up later on to find it on further colonoscopies. What should we use when we tattoo? Um, the guidelines seem to favor something called carbon black, and that's found in India ink or spot, which we use in our unit. India ink can give you a bit of an inflammatory response in the area, and therefore we favor spot over just using India ink. Methylene blue, on the other hand, can sometimes not be permanent, and you might not find the lesion if a, if a long delay happens between the tattooing and the surgery or subsequent endoscopy. What lesions should we be tattooing? Um, Certainly things thought to be colorectal cancers, not necessarily in the cecum. You can get away with not tattooing in the cecum because we know there are other landmarks, such as an appendix, orifice, or an ileocecal valve. Um, High-risk polyps, definitely polyps more than two centimeters, and then lesions that you want to find for EMR or ESD. Where should we put the tattoo? The consensus seems to be that you should do at least three or even four sites. Whether it's three or four will determine whether it's 120 or 90 degree intervals around the circumference of the colonic lumen, and this should be distal to the lesion. How do we do it? Um, if you're experienced in the 
top technique of, of piercing the mucosa with your injection needle tangentially and going straight ahead and injecting the tattoo marker into the submucosa, that's fine. The problem with that is if you go too deep or you go into the deeper layers or even through the, the wall of the colon itself, you can end up with tattoo covering the entire peritoneal cavity, which makes locating lesions at the time of surgery very, very awkward and difficult. What I personally do and what I think is safer in less experienced hands is to form your bleb with some saline, firstly with one mil or so of saline to make sure you are in the right plane and indeed in the submucosa and then inject later a, a bit of, of tattoo marker into that saline bleb. So what about the polyp? The, the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, just lastly on, on tattooing, those are their recommendations. So they recommend using, as we said, sterile carbon particle suspension as your tattoo agent. They prefer using the technique of lifting a saline bleb before injecting the, the tattooing agent. And they also recommend that twos be placed at three centimeters from the, the, the lesion itself. Onto the polyp, what should we have done? Was the polyp appropriately managed? It was a four millimeter polyp, so it fell in that group. And it was quite correctly excised by cold snare polypectomy as recommended in these same ESGE guidelines. Regarding the, this, the polypectomy specimen, however, this is always the information we're most interested in and want from our histopathologist in deciding if the polyp or lesion has been completely excised. And we look at the deep and lateral margins of the polypectomy specimen. So on to the next potential pitfall, would formal MDT review have resulted in further investigations to characterize the liver lesion Further in this case, usually at that meeting, there would be a senior radiologist to review the, the CT and, and comment on the lesion and its likeliness of being a metastasis. And we would then go on to maybe characterize it further with, with other forms of imaging. We already know that MRI with liver specific contrast agent is the preferred modality for evalu evaluating colorectal liver mets. And it's no longer, I think, just about detecting a, a potential met in a liver lesion. Uh, did this liver lesion warrant further characterization to confirm the diagnosis sooner and preoperatively in this case? And finally, was this the correct way to confirm this diagnosis when the liver lesion, the, the capsular or second liver lesion, which we didn't know about preoperatively, was detected at operation? Was it correct to perform a intraoperative biopsy in light of the risk of seeding or should we have just left the lesion well alone? The prevailing sentiment now seems to be not to biopsy. Um, I know Ed feels quite strongly about this, as biopsying a, a lesion certainly intraoperatively can cause tumor seeding and adversely affect the patient's survival. And this graph from the same study shows that your incidence of seeding is between 10 and 19 percent, and your four-year survival in the biopsy group is 32.5 percent versus 46.7 percent. So this person went back to the MDT and actually appeared in the MDT today. And it has been decided due to the histopathology that they will receive a course of adjuvant chemotherapy. And the, the radiologist actually reviewed that liver cyst again, the cystic lesion, and stands by their initial preference at calling this a cyst rather than a, a, a metastatic lesion. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Jeremy, uh, for a very, very nice um, educational case that you shared with us. 
I can't see any um, questions in the chat. Uh, in the chat, so if you've got any, please um, sort of um, type them in there. I just have one a question, maybe one or two comments. So, so the lesion that you saw in the transverse colon, the smaller lesion, do you think that that uh, putting NBI on that thing and and having looked at the at the, the vascular pattern would have maybe made make you it would have made you being a little bit more aggressive in terms of lifting it before you uh, did a cold snare on it? It was it was lifted. It, it definitely was lifted at the time of cold snaring. The oh. endoscopist who performed the cold snare always <laughs> lifts prior to cold snaring. So it certainly was. And the feeling was that it it, it was completely excised. We obviously didn't have confirmation of that on the pathology result. And just one comment on, on the on the cystic lesion in the liver. I was looking for on, on the biopsy for any signs of a mucinous tumor because I won't disagree with the senior radiologist, but I think the one caveat here is in patients with mucinous tumors that you can actually uh, can actually have a quite quite a big um, cystic component in these metastases due to the the, mu the sort of extra um, mucin excretion of the tumors. So one has to be a little bit um, careful with that. And then just the last thing, and you already mentioned that you know, we unfortunately see once or twice a year uh, patients that, that are referred to us that uh, um, we, we, with, with a diagnosis of colorectal cancer and clearly liver metastases on, on cross-sectional imaging, biopsies are performed. Um, true cut biopsies percutaneous. And, and in my Maybe it's sort of a little bit of, of referral bias, but the risk of, of, of patients having peritoneal metastasis, I think, is a little bit higher than is actually quoted in the, in the literature. And it's a really sad story if a patient that was potentially curable uh, presents with, with iatrogenic peritoneal metastases. The, the horse is really um, bolted. So I think what you mentioned is absolutely right, is, is when it comes to characterization, you can push very far with. Um, with um, imaging-based character, uh, characterization rather than putting a, a needle or cutting into a tumor um, at, at operation. Having said that, I think we, we have to be cognizant of the fact that, that the, the imaging that is available and that we assume is available everywhere is not. And, and sometimes the only option would be to, to, to excise a lesion. I would very much advise against cutting into a lesion, but if it's a very small lesion that I assume it was in this case, that, that excising then it's in its entirety and with a nice big margin um, could not be faulted that much. But yeah, yeah. it was, it certainly was on discussion with the, the surgeon that did the case. They, that was the feeling. It was small enough to safely excise with a clear margin rather than cutting into it and not knowing where the end of the, the lesion is. And then just in terms of the, imi the, the, the imaging, whether it's pre-operative imaging or follow-up you know, during follow-up when something is detected, I think there's reasonable data that, that uh, uh, an MRI with liver-specific contrast is the way to go in terms of detection. It's also very good for characterization. And there's is some evidence that if you start up with an MRI, it's, it's on the, in the long run, it's going to be as cheap or as expensive as having a up sort of a, uh, um, uh, starting with a CT and then going on to an MRI if you find something. But again, MRIs are very expensive and, um, and, and not, not available everywhere. All right, if, I don't know if there are any other questions. We still have a few minutes. On the chat, there's was a, was a CT chest done. Yeah, a CT chest and abdomen was included. Uh, chest was included in the abdominal CT, and there were no lung mets. Can, can I just sorry? Please go. Can I just reiterate what um, Jeremy said? You can't tattoo with methylene blue. You won't see it again. It's there for lift or for dye. And the other thing is that we shouldn't speak about distal and proximal. We should speak about anal side or oral if you want to do, because everyone doesn't what distal to what or proximal to what. So it's better to use anal side if you where where you've at sort of three injections, three centimeters anal side of the lesion. Uh, I think that's quite useful. 
Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So uh, I think there's two or three minutes left. Just a comment on, on the lung metastases that was mentioned here. There is reasonable data to suggest that lung metastases in colorectal cancer are, are not, is, is, is really a different disease than, than liver metastases and certainly um, peritoneal metastases. So much so that in, in some of the transplantation data on patients that have had liver transplantations for colorectal mets is that they would, if, if they are isolated lung metastases, would often just watch these and see what happened to them. They tend to, 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 um, to behave completely different. Uh, from 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 um, liver metastases and certainly the, the worst ones like like um, peritoneal metastases. All right, I think I don't see any other questions, so um, I think we can conclude here. So first of all, thank you very much um, to the speakers for uh, for a really very nice session, and again thanks to the Echo um, colleagues at the University of New Mexico and also the Echo India team that also. Uh, often and all, they always join us for these meetings. Thanks Sharon and Karen and the Gastro Foundation, Chris Gassanidis. And then uh, last but not least, uh, the sponsors, Takeda, Aquino, Amgen, Equity and Aspen and Adcock Ingram. We really appreciate uh, any feedback. And I think uh, they, it was also posted in the chat group there. Um, this, uh, it's really important that the sessions are seen as valuable and any uh, comments we would appreciate. And then the recordings of all these sessions are available on the Gastro Foundation uh, website. And then lastly, next week's um, ECHO meeting is going to be a pathology meeting. And I think you've got the, um, the um, ad there uh, uh, yeah, being shared at the moment. So welcome back. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot. Ed, there was still one question in the chat. Perhaps can answer it online. Um, I can do that. We we've got we don't even yeah we've got a few seconds. Um, if MRI in the specific case change anything for a metastatic tumor, is not the best for a primary liver tumor rather. No, so so MRI when it comes to detection, especially if you use an MR if you use a liver specific contrast, that your detection rate is much much better. Um, and, and certainly, I think the, these um, CTs, especially if it's a CT that is, hasn't got a, uh, all the phases, often you would get all the screening CTs, you would get the phase somewhere between the arterial and the venous. Um, but, but when it comes to detection, uh, I think uh, MRI, liver specific contrast, it's even better than, uh, than, uh, than a PET. And the, the, the resolution is probably somewhere around five to 10 millimeters. That is better than most other methods. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Dion. Thank you. Cheers.